Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I think most people here know Florian, but just for those who might be on video, uh, Florian uh, uh, finished his PhD in 2005 at uh, Karlsruhe. He was working with Alex Weibel. He then worked for a few years at Deutsche Telekom on various uh, speechy things and uh, call analytics. Uh, and he's now a faculty at CMU and doing lots of interesting research, including this stuff. So uh, I'm going to let you go for it, Florian. Thank you, Dan. So, Thanks, everyone, for having me, and thanks for allowing me to be here. So this is really work that um, started while I was still a postdoc at uh, Berlin. I started working with Tim, who is now a PhD student at uh, Deutsche Telekom Laboratories and Technical University of Berlin. So yes, you were asking, there's, there's no CMU affiliation on, this, uh, on the title, and that's really because Deutsche Telekom is funding um, Tim, and I'm doing it on my my spare time and because I like the um, because I like the the topic that we're working on so we're trying to um, to find what uh, how much personality we can find in speech and what added value maybe speech could bring to an assessment of personality if um, if you look into it so uh, brief overview I want to start by explaining how you can assess personality in the first place and verify that you can assess personality in speech, because that's not at all clear that this is something that you can reliably um, do, and we want to make sure that this is the case. We started collecting a database on which we then run a couple of um, experiments on both how do humans assess personality in speech and how can machines mimic that process. So we want to first do human, a human baseline experiment on personality assessment from speech and then see how well can a machine do the same. And, uh, Feel free to interrupt me at any at any time during the talk. I, I see doubtful faces already. So. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to send our various presidential candidates samples of their speech oh, through this system. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Notice that they're all psychopathic. Take them obsessed. Or whatever you like them to be. So. That would probably be a cross-cultural perception of speech thing then, because the work that we're doing is on German. And I'm going to play you some, um, some uh, German speech and let you assess the personality, and that's always, <laughs> that's always good for uh, interesting laughs. discussion as well, <laughs> if, not, if not laughs. So. Um, now, why, why do we want to do this? Well, I mean, you, you, know, you all know about emotion detection from, from speech and how that's sort of kind of useful, but not really, because the only emotion you ever find is anger, and that's maybe 5% of the, uh, the time, and 95% of the time, at least in call centers, it's neutral speech. So maybe if you knew what personality a person is, maybe it would be easier and more reliable to detect emotions. So if somebody is a neurotic person, maybe he's going to express emotion differently than somebody who's already a very extrovert person. So if you knew about a person's personality, you could normalize emotion detection. Yeah, so how many classes do you have? Uh, we work with 10 classes, but of course the, the scheme that we're using is sort of a profile, so it's, uh, it's continuous scales, um, so we could have any number of classes. Ten, 10 emotions or 10 personalities? 10 personalities. So what are the 10? Um, I'll, I'll come to that, but there's five, <laughs> five scales. Um, openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extraversion, and neuroticism. I can, I remember them by now. So. <laughs> they're separate from emotion. What are related? Well, yes, of course they're related, um, but they're different. <laughs> so let me, I'll, I'll come, to, come to that in a, in a minute. Um, of course, it would be interesting if we do rich speech transcription, if we could annotate speech with properties saying that this was this type of person saying this. And another thing, and this is really also why Deutsche Telekom is interested in this type of work, is that they spend a lot of time in brand in, on their, their corporate brand. And whenever they do ads, whenever they have voice or call centers, they spend time to make sure that the voice that they use in a call center transports their corporate values. So they do brand monitoring and quality assurance, saying that if you hear a voice in a Deutsche Telekom, at least automated call center, they want to make sure that the voice 
instills in you the values that Deutsche Telekom stands for, which is it's a former state-run company, so they are reliable. They're your grandfather's company. They don't have to be young and hip, but they want to be solid and reliable. So any voice that they want to use in the system and any voice also that they want to use in a TTS, in a speech synthesis system, should also transport these qualities that they stand for, so to speak, a personality. So if you had an automatic system to assess that, that would be a useful instrument um, to make sure that the uh, dialogue systems, for example, transport the brand values. I don't think we're quite there yet, but that's something that this could be, um, this could be used for. And of course, any um, kind of human-computer interaction would be useful if you had personality information, both for recognition and synthesis, if you could synthesize voices with different emotions or personalities. Um, so the work that we're doing could also be used to assess the um, personality and the uh, impression a, synth a synthetic voice uh, leaves in you. So that's what we are um, working towards. Now, what are personalities? Um, I can read to you this uh, definition, which I like. It's a dynamic and organized set of characteristics possessed by a person that uniquely influences his or her cognitions, motivations, and behaviors in various situations. Now, that's a, one of many definitions of personality. And it tells you a little bit, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not very precise, and that's part of the problem here. It's really, <clears throat> I think what it boils down to, it's an analysis of how people and their perceived behavior can differ. So you're looking for a property in a person that others can detect, not directly, but that they can detect because people are doing things in certain ways. So you only observe personality by, by proxy, if you want, because this, per this, this, people, this person speaks like that, this person speaks like that, this, people, this person does these things like this, and this other person does these things like that, and that's because they have different personalities for lack of another um, uh, sort of observable um, property that's different um, between uh, people. The important thing about um, personality and also the differentiator between personality and emotion is that personality is meant to be stable over time. Emotions can change very quickly. So a person, your personality wouldn't change over days, weeks, or even months, while emotions can change within minutes. Within, between the two then, I, don't, I wouldn't argue that there is a clear-cut um, separation between personality and emotions. They are speaker states, if you want, or traits. And at, at least at this point, we, we can't uh, say with certainty, well, this is an influence of personality and this is an influence of um, emotion. You'll always have certain qualities. But here we're looking for something that's um, stable over time. And in psychology, there is what's called the five-factor inventory, FFI, that uses five factors to describe a um, person's personality profile that you can use to measure and predict sort of habitual patterns that a person has in, the, um, in their thoughts, behaviors, and in the way that they express their emotions. Yeah, so, so in corporate world, we normally have the personality defined to be dominant. You know, da, da, da. Is, is that, that true? Is, is that kind of personality? It's, um, <laughs> it's similar. I mean, in, in marketing, they, they have these uh, personas or these prototypical... Um, <laughs> They're four, right? There's, there's several, so, so several five, five. different, I mean, I think the Germany has a different set of personality or of, how do they call it, um, sinus milieus, so they have different <coughs> types of people that they use to do, to do marketing or to do observational studies, and I think they're different from what people use in the US, um, but I think the uh, personality, at least this way of representing personalities, of, it is a kind, kind of academic way of um, describing it where you have a, a space in which you can then distribute your personas or your prototypes um, if you want. But in theory, you should be able to uh, map other schemes into this scheme, uh, how, how well that works. And if one is more suitable to your purpose and one is more suitable to another purpose, that's of course, um, depends on what exactly you want to do. But 
this um, new FFI framework or the new FFI framework that we're using, it's been developed over the course of several um, decades now of research in psychology. It's being essentially measured using a questionnaire of 60 questions that people answer um, either about themselves, then it's called self-assessment, or that they answer about somebody else whom they know, then it's a third-person assessment, and this third-person assessment is generally considered more reliable because people tend to see themselves differently than other people see them, and in the end, what's, what matters or what's more consistent and more reliable is how other people see um, a person. So with this type of questionnaire, the Neo-FFI, about, uh, in English, about 110 studies have been uh, performed with 24,000 participants, and in German, which is what we are using, this work is in German, about uh, 50 studies have been done with um, 12,500, uh, 2,100 uh, 2, participants. So this is the population against which we can compare the personalities that we, and the profiles that we find. So if we have a certain profile, we know where in the space of all these personality profiles um, we are if 20% of the other population is more neurotic than we, than this person is, or 80% is less neurotic, and so on. companies use also, which I, I don't remember the name of it, but it's got uh, judgmental, sensing, um, uh, introverted, extroverted, and there's a couple more axes. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? I know that there's a, I mean, there's also a six-factor inventory, and <coughs> there is categorical, purely categorical schemes and uh, continuous Oh, an intuitive schemes. versus something that yeah. intuitive was another axis. There's a, there's a zoo. Um, I, I may have come across the one that you're talking about, but I've, we've only really worked um, with this one. This is also the, uh, the questionnaire is um, copyrighted, <coughs> so you have, to, you have to pay for it if you, if you use it for every, you pay a dollar, a euro or something per, per questionnaire. Um, but yeah, probably any, any questionnaire has its advantages and its disadvantages, and there's a lot of debate about um, which one's better. And, but this one seems, at least from what we could find, this one is the, the most um, established one, and also one that exists in the, the, essentially the same form in English and German and other languages. So you could, you could do it um, across languages or <coughs> cultures if you, if you want. So what are the five factors that I've been, um, been talking about? Yeah, I found this, uh, this image on the internet, so I just had to, had to use it. It's um, neuroticism, extraversion, openness to experience, agreeableness, and um, conscientiousness. Uh, abbreviation is OCEAN, so you can, you can uh, remember them. And each of these five factors is expressed as a value between 0 and 45, corresponding to low and high. So if you have a low score on the neuroticism axis or on the neuroticism scale, that means that you're not very neurotic. Well, if you have a high value on the neuroticism scale, that means that there's a lot of neuroticism in your personality um, profile. This profile is determined using a questionnaire with um, 60 items which you answer on a five-point Likert scale. So you answer questions like, I like to have a lot of people around me, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, uh, strongly agree, or I often feel inferior to others, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I laugh easily. You either do that about yourself or, or about somebody else, and from these answers, there is a, a set of rules and algorithm that computes this personality profile, and it's not that any of these single questions directly maps to any of these personality factors, but um, it is essentially a, a linear interpolation of your answers to these, um, to these questions, which determines your personality profile as a value, essentially for, for, uh, as a set of five numbers between 0 and 48 that describe how you're, um, how you're supposed to be. <laughs> now, so these are five different axes, <coughs> assuming that they are uncorrelated. Assuming, I'm going to show some, some statistics on that later, of course, uh, 
they're not completely independent. They are independent to some uh, to some extent. But uh, yes, if you if you want to see them as a coordinate system, then or the five-dimensional space, then that's what it's ideally uh, what it would be. Now, what does it mean this personality profile? If, for example, somebody has a low value on the openness scale, then he would be described by words like conventional, simple, unimaginative, literal-minded. While if he had a if a person had a high value on the openness scale, he would be described with words like curious, original, creative, artistic, intellectual, and the same for all the other um, axes. So, the the way to interpret such a profile is to say, well, the more towards the one end of the scale you are, the more people would be likely to use any of these words to describe your, um, your personality. And now what you can do is if you take, for example, a certain sample of a population, if you take 20 people, what we've done here, <coughs> and you sort of average their, um, their personality profiles, then you get a graph like this. Here's the neuroticism, extroversion, and so on axis. Here's the, the median value, the interquartile ranges. So you can see that if you are here, then you know that, um, and you can also, because you know what the total distribution of, the, of personality profiles is from all the 2,000 questionnaires that have been filled out in German or the 12,000 that have been filled out in English, you know what the rest of the population is doing, where they are, so you know where in respect to sort of the, the total population um, you are. So. This is what a personality profile of a single person or a group um, might look like. Now, of course, the question is how, how good are these um, and how independent are these, um, these five axes? Now, here uh, for the, the German Neo-FFI, um, the manual, so the book that describes it, contains a table that shows what's been, uh, what's been computed. And you see that, for example, that the correlations or the off-diagonal correlations between these axes, they are relatively, I would say, well behaved, not in a, uh, maybe in, in, in physics or in um, uh, statistics you would get uh, even lower correlations, but for sort of a, a, a table on psychological data, I think the argument is that these numbers are relatively, um, relatively low, relatively uh, close to zero. But what's, what you notice, for example, is that um, there is a, a strong negative correlation between neuroticism and extraversion. So a person that has a high value on neuroticism has, tends to have a lower value on the extraversion axis and the other way around. And that's kind of intuitive if you would think um, somebody who would be, you would imagine it would be difficult to be neurotic and extrovert um, at the same time. So that's what, what this strong negative correlation means, but all the other numbers are relatively, um, relatively close to zero if you want. Um, so that to some extent, these axes are really independent, but of course it's not a, a completely, um, they're not completely independent in the sense that you, you could vary them uh, totally at your will. of a company uh, might want to project a mature, stable, reliable uh, uh, image. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you mentioned the grandfather voice. What would the grandfather voice be in these terms? We do have... Um... Oh, yeah. So, we do have our... Um, our sort of the Deutsche Telekom corporate voice, uh, which is the, a guy that we were recording for our database. He recorded a number of sentences in his Deutsche Telekom voice. And this is the, um, this is the profile that we computed for this, for this voice. So that, that's exactly these, um, these bars where we computed um, his average profile for a number of samples that he had, um, that he had given. So he scored high on the conscientiousness scale and relatively low on the neuroticism scale and average values if you want on the extraversion openness and uh, maybe a slightly more towards the positive side on the agreeableness um, voice on the agreeableness scale and that would be a, 
uh, maybe your, your grandfather um, <laughs> voice, but uh, that's the personality profile. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I guess that's what you that's what you want to be, right? <laughs> so that's the that's a voice that Deutsche Telekom is uh, is happy with. Um, of course, if if you talk to the marketing folks, if they could also be happy with a voice that has a, a different profile, um, we don't we don't know yet. We haven't done a, a lot of um, studies on that, but that's the profile of a voice that they're happy with. So, um, oh yeah, of course there's a, a lot of, uh, there has been some other works on assessing personality from, uh, from speech, mostly on analysis of psychiatric patients. Uh, Klaus Scherer did a lot of work on that, and also Apple, and that's Apple the person, not Apple the company. Um, they found that uh, extroversion can be estimated from speech reliably, and extrovert speakers, for example, speak louder and with fewer hesitations. So they established that um, you can take uh, speech and derive from speech the, uh, the, or get cues about the personality of a speaker, or if you know what a personality is, make predictions about how this person is going to speak. Recently, um, Francois Meres was doing work on uh, textual information and also intensity and pitch, and he found that also extroversion can be modeled well, followed by what he calls emotional stability, but which is essentially another term for neuroticism. He was using a, a different scheme than what we are um, using. And this also, of course, tells us that uh, personality doesn't only influence the acoustics of how things are being said, but it also influences what's being said. So if you describe a certain image, if you describe a situation, uh, an extrovert person is going to use different words than an introvert person, for example. So that's, of course, also something that we need to control. And then, of course, there's Clifford Nass, who done a lot of work on computer-human interaction, or a lot of work he did work in computer-human interaction, claims essentially that if we talk to a dialogue system, for example, we assign a personality to this dialogue system, to this computer, and we tend to have positive feelings towards a person that, a personality that we encounter that has similar characteristics to our own personality. So he did studies in which people liked a dialogue system better if it was extrovert, if they were extroverts themselves. So this is sort of an, I'm not sure if this is a completely uh, thorough understanding of the problem, but it gives you an indication that personality is um, important to uh, take into account in a human-computer interaction, and he's been exploring some of these ideas. No, it's a, it's a person, it's a, a researcher, not not the company. <laughs> um, he's a psychologist. Okay, so with this, we started collecting a database, and we essentially collected a database in three parts. We took the first part is going to be a professional speaker that we record, that we give a fixed text and ask him to record this fixed single text in various personalities so that we can, that we have a baseline understanding of its active personalities, but we can see what changes and if we can detect it automatically, if people can pick it up automatically. And we're always going to keep the text fixed. Um, the second part of the database, we are relaxing this fixed text constraint and allow the speaker to use different words if he is in different personalities. But, um, and so if somebody listens to that, he might be able to pick up on the personality by the vocabulary, by the lexical information. So that's the difference between the first and the second part. And the third part really is we're putting people from the street or subjects into the same situation as the professional speaker and the second part, they, we asked them to describe images, various images, and um, then we get other people who know them well to do their personality profiles, and then we see if we can pick up speaker independently and in a non-acted situation, cues from the acoustic properties of the speech towards the personality of a, of a person. So we really have three conditions, um, two acted conditions in fixed text and free text, and then 
non-actors, real persons, if you want, that do the same um, free text exercise. And our goal will be to pick up from these three parts of the database, uh, see what changes from condition to condition, and try and understand how well are humans in picking up personalities, and how well are <coughs> how well do machines um, do machines work. Now, let me give you an example of the the data. Um, I think I briefly tested the the audio. So this is a a standard text like it, that it could appear in a Deutsche Telekom call center. And in fact, the, the professional actor recording in a Deutsche Telekom voice, um, a sort of a neutral message, something that's a bit positive, a bit negative, that's friendly, but not overly, overly friendly. So something that we hope could be said in any personality. Willkommen beim Gutscheindienst der Deutschen Telekom. Um Ihren Gutschein einzulösen, geben Sie bitte den Gutscheincode ein. Mit diesem Telefonanschluss können Sie Ihren Gutschein leider nicht einlösen. Rufen Sie bitte diese kostenlose Rufnummer noch einmal an, und zwar von dem Telekom-Anschluss aus, für den Sie den Gutschein einlösen möchten. Vielen Dank und auf Wiederhören. So that's sort of your grandfather, grandfather voice. And here's the, the English translation of the, the text that, uh, this, that this guy has been reading and acting. Now, what we're going to do is we have the personality profile, and now we're going to ask this professional speaker to record um, personality or variations of this text with low neuroticism and high neuroticism, low extraversion and high extraversion, so the, the 10 extremes on, on, on these scales. And we, to, uh, to allow him to do that, we gave him the descriptions of the personality profiles that we find in the <coughs> new FFI framework. So he gets a, a piece of text that essentially contains these descriptions of persons with high neuroticism are expected to be controlled, anxious, and, and so on. And he, he gets some time to put himself in the, uh, in the mood, if you want, and then he produces various um, uh, uh, recordings of um, always the same text in different personalities, which we then recorded. So we have about um, 75 minutes of this 20 second text in various personalities. Now, I know that there's German speakers in the room. Yes? How can you decide on the numerical value of that? Uh, How can we decide on the numerical value? Yes, yes. Okay, so what we, what we do when we have these recordings is we have people come in and they listen to these to the text to the to the audio recording and they fill out the questionnaire so they say they listen to it and they say oh i think that this person is uh, uh, likes laughs easily or this person likes to have other people around me and by filling out this questionnaire we get a uh, we get the numerical value we get the personality profile and the question really is is it reliable if people only have about 20 seconds of speech or maybe a minute of speech, is it reliable that they can fill out this questionnaire and therefore assign a personality profile? But that's, that's what we did. So we, we had a speaker produce many examples of different, person of, uh, different personality pro prototypes and then have people listen to that and fill out the questionnaire. They were free to listen to it as often as they liked so they could listened to it many times, there was no time pressure and everything, and then we, they fill out the, the profile. So, Florian, yep. is this the way your evaluation data is generated or the way your training data is generated? Uh, both. So if humans aren't any good at evaluating personality from speech, but computers could be, <laughs> yeah, we have you're a... limited by the, by the humans. Well, it depends. So here, this part of the database, we have acted data. So it could be that machines are better than humans at picking out the intended uh, variation that the actor produced, um, because we know what the actor was supposed to do. So we could train a system that has super, sorry for using the term superhuman <laughs> performance. Um, and we, in fact, we did two different experiments. So. We did the classification experiment where we tried to reproduce or where we tried to figure out what the actor was doing 
and we did the regression experiment in where we tried to reproduce the ratings that the humans would assign to, to the speech, no matter what the actor was trying to do. Have you tried just using uh, ranking between different speakers? For example, relative. Relative. Yeah, relative. Relative. Yeah, relative. Relative. So basically, this one is more, uh, something like that. <laughs> more yeah. than the other person, just compared to, to, to speech. That's an interesting, an interesting point. Can you, if you listen to two samples, can you, would it be easier to, to describe a difference between two speakers and that's work that I would like to do, that I would like to get funding for. Um, but uh, I don't have any, any funding for that yet and I don't know what the answer was going to be. Um, we've played a little bit with that idea. What do you get when you play two samples and tell somebody, don't tell us what the, um, don't tell us what, what you think this person is, but tell us how different they are. Um, if we really have a metric space, if you want, in which different people would be located, like these personality profiles, would you find that I take a profile that has, uh, that's low here, and I take a profile that's uh, high here, otherwise they're the same, would people then say, oh, this voice sounds uh, a lot more uh, agreeable than the other voice? Or, so I don't, I don't know, but I would like to, I would like to do that experiment, yes. Can easily pretend <laughs> different uh, personalities? <laughs> yes, so I, I told you that personalities don't change, and now I have an actor producing uh, personalities at will. Um, clearly, there's a, there's a problem here. Um, the, the, the actor, these guys, so what this, guy, what this guy does is he, does, uh, he dubs movies also. So. He's been doing a lot of movies and playing different characters in different movies. And so what he gets in that context is a short description of what the character is. He reads the script and all that, and then he produces different, um, different voices. So somehow this actor has a superhuman capability of producing different voices, even though his personality doesn't, doesn't really change. Um, but of, of course, we're open to criticism in the same sense that um, emotion detection on um, acted emotions detects something that's very different from real emotions, but um, it tells you something about the space of the problem where you're, where you're in. And for example, for uh, synthesis experiments and for analyzing synthesized personalities or emotion, this data is very, um, very useful. But yes, the basic fact is that here we have one person um, producing speech with different personalities. that you used are kind of very formal and polished then so I, I'm wondering <coughs> how uh, much you can use it so if a person uh, talks freely and is say in a uh, extreme emotional state I would expect that the, uh, the uh, speech stumbles at, a, at certain critical moments and you would also diff use different words to express something uh, a specific thing can you estimate how how much information is encoded in the wording that yeah you yeah, yeah so this is the first part of the database where we have a fixed text and the only thing that changes is the acoustics. In the second part of the database, we allow the speaker to use different words. And in the third part of the database, we allow different speakers to do different, uh, to use different words in the same condition. So that's exactly why we designed these three, these three steps. So, so roughly, I'm talking about it. Yeah, what does voice sound like? English well, let me, let, me, let me play you a, a German neurotic voice. If you, <laughs> the, typical, the typical way I, I do this because it's so much fun is that I, I ask you to close your eyes for a second and I'm going to play you one of um, low agreeableness, high neuroticism and high extraversion and I'm going to have you guess what it, what it is now. <laughs> Say again. Willkommen beim Gutscheindienst der Deutschen Telekom. Um Ihren Gutschein einzulösen, geben Sie bitte den Gutscheincode ein. Mit diesem Telefonanschluss können Sie Ihren Gutschein leider nicht einlösen. Rufen Sie bitte diese kostenlose Rufnummer noch einmal an, und zwar von dem Telekom-Anschluss aus, für den Sie den Gutschein einlösen möchten. Vielen Dank und auf Wiederhören. So, yeah, what's, what are the, what's the guess for what that is? Extra, what's A stand for? Uh, A is agreeableness. Oh, agreeable. 
but it's so no, low. Yeah, it's right. He calls yeah. it. E. Yeah. <laughs> the big E. So this is this is high extroversion. And yeah, the other choices are low agreeableness or high neuroticism. So I'm going to play you one of those two now. Willkommen beim Gutscheindienst der Deutschen Telekom. Um Ihren Gutschein einzulösen, geben Sie bitte den Gutscheincode ein. Mit diesem Telefonanschluss können Sie Ihren Gutschein leider nicht einlösen. Rufen Sie bitte diese kostenlose Rufnummer noch einmal an, und zwar von dem Telekom-Anschluss aus, für den Sie den Gutschein einlösen möchten. Vielen Dank und auf Wiederhören. <lacht> So, is that low agreeableness or high neuroticism? <laughs> Anybody else? No, no. Low agreeableness would be like, be you know, go fuck yourself. That, that would be, <laughs> well, the neuroticism would be like more like, you know, like, like, Maybe like, different, like, I think this like is Woody how Allen, he I think it. of Woody Allen and not Woody Allen. I know what you mean. But I think this is how he interpreted neuroticism about like being really sad and kind of. Yeah. So, you, you guys are good. This is, in fact, high neuroticism. Um, I'm going to go away and kill myself now. I'm going to give you low agreeableness, and that's really... I'm, I'm, well, it's going to be... I'm going to kill you if you ever call me again. Pretty much, at least that's... Willkommen beim Gutscheindienst der Deutschen Telekom. Um Ihren Gutschein einzulösen, geben Sie bitte den Gutscheincode ein. Mit diesem Telefonanschluss können Sie Ihren Gutschein leider nicht einlösen. Rufen Sie bitte diese kostenlose Rufnummer noch einmal an, und zwar von dem Telekom-Anschluss aus, für den Sie den Gutschein einlösen möchten. Vielen Dank und auf Wiederhören. Can you play the The, the middle one. Willkommen beim Gutscheindienst der Deutschen Telekom. Um Ihren Gutschein einzulösen, geben Sie bitte den Gutscheincode ein. Mit diesem Telefonanschluss können Sie Ihren Gutschein leider nicht einlösen. Rufen Sie bitte diese kostenlose Rufnummer noch einmal an, und zwar von dem Telekom-Anschluss aus, für den Sie den Gutschein einlösen möchten. Vielen Dank und auf Wiederhören. So yeah, so those are the, the a sample of the 10 different and the neutral, neutral middle dimension that we, that we have. And even though it's cross-lingual or cross-cultural, if you want, it seems to be that there's a few universal, thi universal things in there that allow you to pick it up. But clearly, it's something that's dependent on, uh, on, on language. But it's clearly something that's very, um, that's, uh, That's something that you want to be able to understand in a human-computer interaction system. And I mean, I'm, I'm sounding like Alan Black now. That if you want, if you build speech synthesis, you want this also. You want to be able to do to do these um, these kind of things. And also, a system should be able to pick up on these type of differences. An automatic system and do something with it. Now, there's a um, one uh, fun fact for you. Do you do you recognize? Uh. It looks, oh, yeah. it looks like that it's guy American down in California. Pie. It's American Pie. Oh, wait, who, who's the guy? Oh, is that, uh, what's, it, Jason Black? Wait, what is his name? I don't know what his name is. Wait, so what's, what, what's the... Yeah, the, the question is, who are, who are these guys? This um, is the American Pie. Oh, okay. This is American Pie, yeah. That's the movie, American Pie. And our speaker, he's the German voice of Kevin. So, uh. I don't know if Deutsche Telekom knows or... Yeah, I'm not sure that's not really good for their brand. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that, that's, this is what this guy does for a living in um, dubs, um, dubs movies. So, okay, so what we've done is we've um, recorded um, a number of, we've recorded this uh, total of 75 minutes of the speaker reading uh, this one sentence in various personalities. And we've recorded about um, more than three hours of this um, speaker describing um, a selection of these images in various personality styles. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that we put him in a, in a task that he has to do that doesn't involve any other human that could influence um, the way he speaks. But 
these images. I mean, there's a selection of um, romantic, uh, abstract, scary, uh, peaceful images. Depending on what image he's looking at and what image he's describing, depending what personality he is uh, uh, sort of doing, that should influence the way that he's uh, that he's um, speaking. These most of these images are also taken from uh, what's known as the systematic perception test, which is a standard psychology test where exactly people look at what words do people use to describe these images and that allows them to take some, um, uh, sort of get some clues about uh, what personality or mental state a person is, um, is in. And that's all been done in a in a studio uh, with high quality recordings and uh, no, no noise and, and everything. And again, also for the um, non-acted personalities, uh, so for the people from the street that we brought in, we did the same uh, uh, image tests and also a few human, human interaction domains where people talk to each other to get data in a comparable um, uh, situation to which we have the recordings of the actor and I would like to report on on the results of these but we're not we're not done yet Tim is a, a young father and work is going slower than we were hoping it would so but now what do we get we have this database where we have 10 different uh, types of recordings of the same um, always the same text and we bring in and the first thing we did is we selected from uh, from these 75 minutes and from all these samples, we gave two students the task to rate them, to rate every sample individually. And I think we have 20 or 30 repetitions of each uh, utterance in each personality um, profile. So we ranked them according to naturalness and threw away the ones that sounded most, un, uh, that sounded the least natural so that we don't have any obvious um, obviously faked or obviously acted um, samples in our database. And then we had in total 87 test persons come in, listen to their samples and fill out the personality profile of the person that they're listening to, the voice that they're listening to, um, while they could listen to the data as often as they wanted. And this is what we get. So on the five scales for the uh, variations towards low values and the variations towards the high values, we get uh, medians and uh, interquartile ranges, and it's clear that these are uh, clearly separable. And for example, extraversion seems to be separable reasonably well. Neuroticism works um, uh, better. Agreeableness works probably the same as neuroticism. Uh, conscientiousness works quite well, but openness, for example, is something that either our speaker doesn't isn't able to separate very well, or it's not uh, this task, this text isn't good to distinguish openness very well, or it's just not something that you can pick up from, uh, from speech very well. But um, it's clear that the same, that what the experiment that you were doing in this setting, this is something that you can, um, that you can pick up and that you can, that humans at least can, uh, can tell apart. Now, when we're doing the same from uh, with the free speech, so the descriptions of these images where we're varying the textual information that's also being said, originally we were expecting that, well, we're adding another sort, another dimension uh, of information, so this should be easier to pick up. So if I have a description of an image in a neurotic personality versus a non-neurotic personality, if I can also vary the text, that should make the distinction between the two even, even easier because the words would also be different. But it turns out that this is not the case. So here's the, the old image for comparison. Uh, the overall structure of the result is quite, quite similar. Um, openness is again, can't, you can't distinguish openness, but even the other ones are uh, closer together. So our um, understanding for the moment, although we don't have any way of proving that, is that um, the actor is sort of hyper-articulating, if you want, in the red speech and the fixed text case because he's always, he's, he's sort of, because he's always producing the same text, he's learned very well how to do that in, 
in uh, various personalities. And what we could do, for example, is have him re-speak things that he has said uh, about an image and have him re-speak that over and over again to see if he sort of, uh, if that's an, an effect of entrainment for the actor or if it's really the case that um, <clears throat> the, uh, the length of the utterance or anything else that's uh, a difference, a differentiated between the two um, is, makes it harder for him to produce it or for people to pick it up at this point. We don't know, but it's interesting to note that um, it's easier to pick up these personalities from a, uh, a short sample that's uh, been read versus a longer, longer sample where we also vary the, the lexical um, content. And we, we do have transcriptions of the data now, but we haven't done any lexical analysis to see which words were varied, if any, and what's, what's going on there. But that's on the, the list of things um, to do. Now, the next thing that we looked at also is if we know that this is the sort of the, the table of correlations between uh, different personality factors, how does it look like for speech? So the top one, NeoFFI, that's the one from uh, psychology. How does it look like for, for us, for the fixed text case and for the free text case? Now, the, the first thing, of course, is that um, the overall the off-axis correlations are much, much bigger in, in our case, simply because we have a lot less samples. But if we look for the, the free text case, for example, where we do have most, um, most data, then we see that the numbers overall, the absolute values of the off-axis correlations tend to be smaller than in the fixed text case. So they tend to be better. And also the biggest value here, uh, the biggest negative correlation is also between neuroticism and extroversion in the sort of the same structure as we see it in the uh, neo-FFI case, so in the psychology case. So still, given the, the number of samples that we have, I wouldn't call it a significant uh, result yet, but it's, it sort of, it seems plausible that this is going in the, um, in the, right, um, in the right direction, that all the, the other values tend to be um, uh, smaller than, than here, and in many cases they have the same sign, at least, as the correlations that we find in the... Yes. So you yes. use that to assign the label. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then these are human listening. Yeah, yeah. These are these are all human listening tests. And then you just yeah. Just yeah. The what what we what we're trying to uh, to understand here is is this a I mean is this a, a good protocol to use? Um, when can people pick up personality from twenty seconds of speech or from uh, longer seconds of speech, or is or are we just measuring? Uh, this is sort of seeing if people can catch. It catch what an actor is yes. saying, yes. which I think is different from personality. Yeah. It's like, can you read an actor? <coughs> I mean, I, why not do something where, like, you go to NPR, where they have a lot of interviews. They interview doesn't, you know, well, not doesn't, but a few people yeah. a day. And so you get these samples of all these different people they interview, and then go to other people and say, look, does this person sound erotic? Does this person sound agreeable? Yeah. And, and then you're working with data that just sort of naturally occurs, but it's still going to come from a big range of personalities, probably, because they're interviewing a lot. Yeah, we, we, we could do that. And I mean, other people have done that. Um, the, uh, why we didn't do, I mean, we started off with a single speaker because that was also what uh, the, company, um, the company was using, what the company was interested in, and we could also use it for synthesis, so that's, what we can do with this data, what you can't do with um, this type of data. But still, do, you don't know, right? for the natural uh, interview, you know, how do you know? You still need to provide the test in order to know whether that person actually is mislabeled. But that, those are uh, real behavior, not the fact that you have. And if you could tell if people agree <coughs> or <coughs> don't agree. Or yeah. Say, yeah. But if they're politicians, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other people like the interview authors, and, you know, <laughs> movie directors. Yeah, there would there would be a couple of very interesting things to do. One would be to take movie, um, to take not the original soundtrack of movies, but the soundtrack or the, the sound recordings that these guys do for movies, because then you have it without background music, without noises, 
and they do the same thing. Lots of material in different personalities, or as you say, take, take interviews. Um, there is work, a group in Trento in Italy is working on, uh, they, they try to figure out um, personalities of uh, call center operators or people in a call center. And their first look at their data was that their rec both human assessment and automatic recognition rates were very, very poor. So they added a uh, telephony channel. Don't know if that's, if that's a difference, but so yeah, it's clear that with an, age, with an actor, we're making the task a lot easier while with, um, and we have less data, while when you're going to the telephone and take samples, you make the task harder, but you have a lot more data. So I, I had to interact with um, American Express to make a reservation today for ICASP. And I'll, I'll say, as usual, I could tell, you know, within like 10 seconds of the person saying hello, whether the person was going to be able to solve the problem or not. <laughs> it, like, competent versus not competent. I claim you can yeah. determine that on the telephone with some, an operator, you know, within 10 seconds, 5 seconds. <laughs> the, I, I agree. I mean, you, you have an, an estimate of a personality. If it's accurate or not, that's, that may be one thing. Or if it corresponds to what people who know this person um, uh, also assign to this person, um, we, you don't know. But it's clear that in your application domain, that's what you're eventually, that's what you're eventually, eventually after. That's what you're eventually interested in. You don't need to know a personality. You want to know, is this person going to solve my problem or not? And for that, you may not need this whole five-factor inventory um, shenanigans. Yeah, maybe competence would be one of personality. <laughs> <laughs> That's a general intelligence one, right? somehow. You want a button to be charged to a machine. Thank <laughs> you. So what we, the next step that um, Tim is currently working on is taking the personality labels that uh, people who know our subjects well assign to our um, people who have been giving us speech and see how the uh, assigned personality on the audio corresponds to the, um, to the personality that um, people are uh, assigned to by people who know them well. But we don't have these, um, we don't have these, these results yet. But clearly, I mean, the, the big data approach is always collected somewhere label it and, um, and uh, see, see how reliable it is. And that's just as valid, um, I think, as doing what, what we are doing here. Um, another thing that we, that we analyze is if we, uh, if we do the recordings at different points in time and also if we do the annotations, so if we do the labeling at different points in time, does that influence the, the results? And of course, the statistics get poorer if we divide our set into three subsets and had one labeled at, uh, uh, at th one month intervals by the same people. And to the extent that um, we have reasonable statistics, uh, in 36 out of 40 tests, we are confident that um, the, time, uh, the time of the recording and the time of the labeling doesn't uh, influence our results. So that's something we want to make sure that um, this is a uh, reproducible experiment. Um, then we, we looked briefly, let's skip over that a little bit. We also looked at um, if the actor is varying one axis, how does it influence the perception of the other axis? So if he, for example, um, increases neuroticism, then we find there's a significant decrease in the perception of extraversion. And if he, for example, increases extraversion, we find that there's a significant decrease in neuroticism. And that's also consistent, or you would expect this kind of when you think that there's this, indeed, there's this negative correlation between um, values assigned on a, uh, between the neuroticism and extroversion uh, scales. Other than that, there doesn't seem to be too many um, other interplays, as we called it. Now, last part is a signal-based analysis. If humans can do it, how well can, um, can machines do it? We're doing two different things, predict human ratings and classifying the intended um, personality. And of course, we're doing uh, 
a standard approach, we extract a large number of audio descriptors, MFCC features, uh, uh, harmonics to noise ratio, zero crossing rate, uh, intensity pitch loudness for voiced, unvoiced segments and silent segments. Um, where we extract where there's silence and then total about 1,200 features. We use uh, an information gain ratio filter for ranking these features according to how well they could work in, uh, in a classifier, use tenfold cross-validation, SVM um, regression and an SVM uh, classifier and uh, build, build a classifier on, in this case, again, the acted and say fixed text data. And we see that, well, after about um, 20 samples, we're already getting a, uh, after about uh, 20 features that we put into the classifier, we already get a, a relatively stable um, performance. And this is the regression experiment. We can predict the uh, extroversion rating that a certain speech sample will receive by our humans with uh, a correlation coefficient of almost 0.7. Neuroticism works uh, a lot less well, about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. And agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness are even below that. But these are also the factors that humans aren't good at, um, at estimating from, from speech. So it's not surprising that, uh, or I don't know, you would expect that the correlation of a human assessment uh, with an automatic assessment wouldn't be too high, too high either. What's interesting is that this seems to be saturating after maybe 30 um, features that you put into this predictor. And if you do an analysis of uh, what are these features, what are the salient features that the machine picks out to predict personalities, well, you find that here for the example of the extraversion versus the neuroticism, you see that a lot of the extraversion features are pitch related. And that's consistent with psychology literature that uh, variations in pitch are a good predictor of um, the extroversion in, in a person. Of course, there's the MFCC features that pop up everywhere, although they, they shouldn't. Uh, neuroticism, there's several intensity and loudness features, so features capturing dynamics and also a pitch and um, MFCC features. And it's also consistent that uh, the voice of a neurotic person is very controlled, very, very flat, very level, with very few changes in, um, in dynamics. Um, and yeah, we did the classification <laughs> experiment. So for the, intent, for the intended variations of our actor, we did, again, tenfold cross-validation, SVM classifier. And this is a setup as a 10-class problem, and we're getting about 60% accuracy um, on uh, the 75-minute data set, so six times chance. And we, we're working on um, doing the, repeating the experiment on the larger, the larger data set with um, uh, text independent and, uh, and also with uh, the, the large number of speakers, not only the single, the single actor. So the ground truth comes from where? Here the ground truth is the intended, uh, uh, so the instruction for the, for the actor. When we told him, make this extrovert, make this uh, introvert, this is the ground truth for training and test, um, training and test here. So that, that's also why this is different from the um, regression. OK. Um, yeah, there is a number of, uh, for the classification, we see that, for example, neuroticism and conscientiousness work, um, work quite well, while extroversion works uh, slightly less well measured by the F measure per, per class, and openness and agreeableness seem to be working, or seem to be hard to, um, to classify. So for consciousness, how would you be typical example? Conscientiousness is sort of how I, um, a conscientious person is somebody who is, who you think is reliable, um, careful, I think it's also planned in some sense. I, I could see if I have samples of conscientious versus non-conscientious non on, on my computer, but it's, um, it's interesting that um, the conscientiousness works well in the automatic classification, while in human <coughs> assessment, conscientiousness doesn't work uh, quite as well. And 
Yeah, so that pretty much um, sums up our uh, the, the state of our, the results that we have right now. We we think that the, the protocol that we're following allows us to measure uh, the personality of a person reliably, quite reliably, from uh, from the voice. Definitely in the actor case, um, and we are, for the results that Tim is getting now also for the actor in a free text case for when we the database that we have recorded under the same condition as the actor with people from the street we haven't fully we haven't run the statistics on that yet we collected it so we hopefully have results um, later in the year um, what we find is that uh, the neurotic is clearly distinct while um, very open and very extrovert are very similar acoustically. I've skipped over that in the details. Uh, neuroticism and extroversion are in human assessment uh, sort of reciprocal. Um, openness typically tends, the perception of openness tends to follow agreeableness, if at all, um, but openness is the most challenging feature. And um, on the automatic assessment, it works quite well um, for neuroticism and extroversion. Conscientiousness classifies well, but we have a hard time or a harder time predicting the human perception of conscientiousness and uh, agreeableness uh, sort of correlates moderately with user assessment, but we have a harder time classifying it if you sort of want to rank these features relative to each other with how well they, they do. And openness is sort of an, an unsolved uh, case. We can't, humans don't assess it well and automatic assessment doesn't, doesn't work well, so that's certainly the weakest of the five, um, the five factors. So ongoing work, we've done a summer workshop at Johns Hopkins on uh, using emotional speech synthesis, using articulatory features as parameters that you can uh, change and use in a parametric speech synthesizer. And we're using these, this database and these, this classification approach to measure how well a synthesizer produces um, uh, speech with emotional or uh, characteristics uh, that doesn't mean that the speech is understandable but it's emotional and of course we want to uh, continue on the text independent and speaker independent uh, case here to see, see where we are and of course uh, we're we'll very interested to see how we go with um, non-acted uh, speakers and non-acted results and this is some sort of schizophrenic uh, setup that we have one single person producing uh, speech in different personalities. Tim wants to look at uh, what personality factors, what independent factors can you extract from the data, if any are they different from the ones that you think you find in, in um, the psychology, or depending on how much data we have, we might be able to do that and uh, yeah, merge the acoustic information that we have here with um, textual information and see which is more salient, which is um, harder or easier to Extract and what does it, for example, mean if the message that you're getting from a from the text channel doesn't match the acoustic channel? So if we had a if we take the text that the actor produced as an erotic person and synthesize it in a non-erotic voice or have him speak it in a non-erotic voice, does that sort of send mixed signals and confuse um, a user, or is one beating the other? So there's a lot of um, things that you can play with there. And um, that concludes my talk. So. Yeah. Any questions? So I think Florida will be meeting with a couple of people now. And uh, I hope you're enjoying your time in Seattle. I do. <laughs> the, West Coast, uh, the West Coast meet all of your expectations.